This is a battlefield where both armies have the same weapons capabilities, but one of them has AI and the other does not. Let's see how a battle between these two plays out. In the process, we'll learn why Vladimir Putin once told a group of young students that whoever leads an AI will rule the world, and why the White House recently issued its first memo on AI, calling it an era-defining technology with significant and growing relevance to national security. To understand this, I've teamed up with Shawshank Joshi. Hello, good afternoon, Johnny. The defense editor at The Economist, who's likely one of the most knowledgeable people on the planet when it comes to this topic. We're beginning to see artificial intelligence pretty much in every single decision made in war. So let me show you how artificial intelligence is transforming war. So let me clarify, this is not a sponsorship with The Economist. There's a sponsor later on in the video. This is a partnership and kind of a dream come true to work with this newspaper that I've been reading since I was in college, studying international relations. So I'm really just shouting them out because I feel an immense amount of gratitude for what they've taught me about the world. In addition to their excellent short form video, they've also started giving away access to their short form news app called Espresso for free to high school and college students who are over 16. Super cool. Again, not a sponsor. I just want to get the word out here. So now let's get back into this video. The examples that compel people the most are often the munition, the weapon system, the thing that does the killing, right? And this is the killer drone, the killer robot. But what I think is that often the key decisions in war are not the ones at the very end. They're not the ones that happen just before a bomb goes bang. And I think that's where AI is really affecting the battlefield the most. Okay, so we've made these two hypothetical armies. Here on the battlefield, both of these armies are effectively trying to do the same thing. They're both trying to somehow get eyes into enemy territory to find the enemy's most valuable military targets, to fix their exact location, to determine what weapons to use and how to properly target and deploy them, and then to actually fire on those targets, to engage so that it actually hits the target, and then finally to assess to see if it worked. This is called the kill chain, and it is how war is fought. But executing this kill chain is not straightforward. It's the job of commanders on both sides to make countless decisions, often with incomplete or unreliable information. And victory tends to favor those who can gather the best information and make accurate decisions the fastest. So let's see how both of these sides approach their kill chain, one with AI and one without. Hey, before we get back onto the battlefield, um, I'm currently in my home with a sweatband on because I am exercising, which is something I have to do every day to be a happy adult. I'm telling you all this because it has to do with the sponsor of today's video, who is TrainWell, which is a platform that connects you with a personal trainer who designs a workout for you that you can do right in your home using this very cool app. So here's how it works. Devin's been my personal trainer on this app for like a couple of years now. I told him all my goals, which for me is like, I just wanna be able to like lift my body and like be functionally strong. And then he designs a workout for me. It's all visual, which I love. And it comes not just with photos, but with actual videos of exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. This makes a huge difference for me for some reason. Like at six in the morning when I don't really wanna be working out, but I know my day will be better if I do, having just a flow of looped videos telling me exactly what I'm supposed to do and then a button that I can press to be like, I completed this workout is awesome. And then I can give feedback to Devin. I can be like, hey, the abs part was too difficult today. Can you make it a little easier tomorrow or something like that? Oh, and if the personal trainer you're assigned isn't a good fit, you can switch at any time. Devin has sketched out my whole week based on my goals. And so every day there's a different workout. I still get to have goals. I still get to give feedback, but I don't have to make any of the decisions. There's a professional personal trainer doing that for me. And I don't have to leave my home, which like I just never got into the habit of going to the gym. For me, working out is a non-negotiable. I have to exercise to be a happy adult. And having something that takes away all the decision-making and keeps me accountable, like that is the key for consistency for me. If you wanna try this out, you can get 14 days for free if you use the link in my description. Go to trainwell.net slash Johnny Harris. Clicking that link helps support the channel, but it also gets you 14 days for free on this platform. I appreciate Trainwell for sponsoring today's video, for supporting our journalism. We are now going to leave my home, go back onto the battlefield to see how AI is changing the nature of war. Well, militaries will use what they call sensors to go find things. That could be anything that looks at the world. Both sides have all sorts of sensors that are looking into their enemy's territory. The classic example is an electro-optical sensor on a satellite, right? In, in, that's fancy words for a camera that is just looking at stuff. 
They both have drones in the air, scanning for targets. A reconnaissance team on the ground. They've got radar, sensing what's flying through the air. The data from these sensors is being recorded and eventually is sent back to a central command center. This is where the decisions are made on what the army will do next, using all of this data from their sensors. So someone has to be sifting through all of the satellite images. And this is where we see the first big advantage for the side with AI, computer vision. Object recognition has just exploded in how good it is. If you look back at the way that AI broke through and advanced around 2012, it was picking out images, in particular recognizing images of cats. And if you can recognize a cat, you can recognize a tank. The AI command center is armed with computer vision software that is processing all of this incoming visual data and tagging it with what they think they're looking at and its precise location. Now you have machines automatically looking over those images, picking out enemy planes, enemy formations, and saying, hey, I think with 90% probability that I'm pretty sure is a tank. And I've worked this out on the drone itself the exact coordinates it's at. The other military that doesn't have AI is doing the same thing, but without computer vision algorithms. There's a lot of friction in this process. You had humans pouring over every single image. They're slowly identifying their targets. A tank here, an airfield there, plotting them on a map, doing it manually. Oh, and by the way, this map only exists here in this command center. They haven't even started communicating all of these targets and intelligence to other command centers. Meanwhile, the computers over in this other command center are automatically adding all of their findings to a database that's in the cloud that other command centers have access to as well. An AI-enabled army is fusing all kinds of data, mobile phone records, data from ship tracking websites, uh, aircraft tracking websites, consumer retail activity, who is buying products near this naval base or near that airfield that might indicate activity. So you're fusing these vast torrents of data, spitting out anomalies. So their maps are filling up much quicker, filling up with potential targets and even context on each of these targets. A commander who sees the targets, then has to decide a lot of things. Are they going to hit them or not? Is it valuable enough? What am I going to use? Do I use a plane, an artillery battery, something else? These are all basically the bread and butter of any command decision. But this is still just the beginning of the kill chain. These are hard decisions, but the AI-enabled commander has some help. A software platform has fused all of this data together and is starting to make predictions and inferences, giving recommendations to the commander, taking into account not only the target they're trying to hit, but also many other important factors. I know that you have this many planes. I know that you have this much fuel on the airfield, this much ammunition. Here is the optimal way to destroy that target using these aircraft, coolant, fuel, oil, repairs, rest for the crew, food for the crew. These are all so fundamental. So a lot of the stuff that was being done in your headquarters by dozens of mid-level officers with pens, papers, spreadsheets can be done by software. So a human might be able to do all of these things, but it might take them like a couple of days to do it. The code can do it in like a 10th of the time, way, way more quickly. So while the traditional army is still manually plotting potential targets, the AI army's commander is looking at a list, a list generated by his software, a list of targets. The software is proposing that they could hit a group of tanks that they found near the front line. They could take out a bridge that serves as an important supply line. They could target an ammunition depot that the AI believes that most of the enemy's ammunition reserves are being held. The commander evaluates these recommendations from the software and decides to target the ammunition depot using some artillery cannons that the software has confirmed have recently been serviced and have plenty of ammunition for this operation. He taps a few buttons on a screen and a mix of humans and software start preparing to engage. This all happened very quickly, and over on the other side, they're just starting to assemble an initial list of valuable targets. The AI-enabled commander now has time to think about other potential targets. Its software is recommending that he send a swarm of drones with explosives attached to them to destroy this fleet of enemy tanks. 
here's where we see yet another massive advantage of AI. These drones are piloted by humans, but as they get closer and closer to their target, the enemy sends out jamming signals to interfere with the connection between the pilot and the drone. Suddenly I'm not able to pilot my drone because there's all this radio noise overwhelming the signal. The pilot can no longer control the drone. What if the drone didn't need to have a pilot? Thanks to recent advances in AI, this drone can start flying itself. It is looking at the object, it's comparing it to a library of images stored on the platform, and it's saying, I know I am supposed to hit this thing. So it locks on to the target and it says, I am going to just keep going. I can maneuver to that target in the final last 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters of flight. That's a real shift in the character of warfare when you have that precision guidance, not just on exquisite high-end systems, but on so many tiny little systems throughout the battlefield. You can see where this is going. The AI-enabled army is able to pull off these attacks much quicker with way more information, all enabled by algorithms that are crunching huge amounts of data. So even though these two armies have the same hardware, what matters more and more is what's inside. What really matters is the software. What really matters is the algorithm inside. Okay, so this was a hypothetical and simplified scenario. But in the real world, this is effectively the direction that warfare is going, relying more and more on software. Let's go through a few examples. Like in Gaza, where the Israeli military uses data from tapped phones and people's locations to algorithmically choose targets to strike. That's a kind of AI target system, generating huge numbers of targets per day of suspected Hamas militants. According to six Israeli soldiers speaking to an Israeli publication, the IDF has based a lot of its airstrikes off of AI-generated lists, treating these target lists, in their words, quote, as if it were a human decision. Now, the IDF does dispute this characterization, but the point is, AI algorithms are already being used on the battlefield to choose targets. Then there's Ukraine. Ukraine? above all is going to be the key test bed because that's where we're seeing some of the most advanced military AI play out on both sides, tested, experimented. The major innovation here has been in drones, something we made a whole video about. More and more software and computer vision is allowing these drones to complete the final leg of their flight, to hit their target even when the signal has been jammed and the pilot has lost control of the drone. Here in the United States, we are seeing more and more tech startups who are preparing for this new form of warfare, one that relies so much more on sensors and data and and algorithms that can make sense of it all to make wartime decisions. This is all about autonomy, and that will be delivered more than anything else by software. The US military has been developing an AI system that can take a massive amount of aerial and satellite imagery and pick out potential enemy targets, sometimes more accurately than humans can. The UK has a similar program. And because data from sensors is such a huge part of this capability, you see more cloud computing companies like Amazon and Microsoft getting involved in defense. One data analytics company, Palantir, works a lot in defense now and says that their software allows the US military to conduct an operation that used to require 2,000 people, and now they can do it with just 20. Because software can now do a lot of that work of analyzing, synthesizing, and helping make decisions that used to be the work of lots of people. The holy grail for any military trying to get ahead on this is to aggregate all of the data from all of their many sensors into one integrated platform, one central command software that can help commanders make decisions. The US Army is working on one ambitious project that does just that. Project Convergence uses high-tech equipment the Army says is more efficient and faster than humans. So these are just a few examples of real-world applications of AI being integrated into war. There are so many more and there will continue to be new programs and initiatives as this technology changes and as we learn. If it really does all the things that proponents say it can do, then there are some people who will draw a comparison to things like the advent of gunpowder. Okay, but wait, shouldn't we slow down and ask, yes, we can do this, this is something that technology allows us to do now, but is it ethical? Is it legal? Is it safe? Could it get out of control if we give more and more information and decision-making abilities 
to a computer? Will AI make war easier and quicker? Will taking humans out of the process make it less humane? A lot of people who are against what they call killer robots will say a human must always retain control over the decision to use force. You know, do I kill them or not? I think that's the wrong way to think about it. The bit that will always be most controversial is the final lethal decision. You could argue the really consequential step was taken when you identified something as a target in the first place. Would we rather have a commander who is pressing a red button to approve a target that's offered to him by a computer, but is, is mashing the red button on loop saying, yup, 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 that doesn't seem like human control to me, even though from a technical perspective, yeah, they're signing off on each target, but they're doing so without any real engagement, moral or intellectual, with what they are doing. Like any technology, it's not one way or the other. It comes down to how well we understand it and how we use it. Shawshank argues that what's most important isn't whether or not we give decision-making and autonomy to these machines, but whether or not the human who is in control and actually making the decisions based on what the machine is telling them understands the software what it's good at and what it's not. Whereas if you have a computer system that is offering a bank of targets and the commander is scrutinizing those and knows the system, he knows what it's been trained on and therefore he knows when it might work effectively and when it might not. And he knows when not to rely on it. He knows when to question it, when to mistrust its inputs. That seems to me much more like human control, even if he is ceding quite a lot of control in some circumstances, but holding it back in others. For me, that is the debate. It's way more complex than, you know, hand over to the killer robots or not. It's when are you trusting the systems? When, what do you know about them? Have you interrogated them to understand what their weak spots are? That to me is really where the debate should be. As we saw earlier, in war, whoever can get the most information and make the most accurate, fastest decisions is usually the victor. Humans tend to assume that decisions made by a machine are correct, which makes us particularly prone to be swooned by AI generated information. I mean, I feel this. When I talk to ChatGPT, I often feel a bias to believe it because it sounds right. The machine just spit it out in this digestible, authoritative, natural language. So there will be a lot of incentive and momentum to let the machine do a lot of the work, to make decisions quickly and deal with the consequences later. Something we may not be able to catch until it's too late. Machines are going to make mistakes. They'll do some horrible things. They will encourage you to bomb a building that you thought was a military target that turns out to be a shelter for civilians. But hey, guess what? Humans do that as well. The question is, are machines going to reduce the incidence of those things? The reality is, there's no going back. No one's going to pump the brakes on integrating AI technology into warfare. No one's going to wait for the ethicists and the lawyers to decide if this is ethical or legal or safe. Geopolitics will force this forward. All we can hope for is wisdom and foresight from those making the decisions on how we use these systems so that we approach it humanely and responsibly. The future is going to be humans working with AI to wage war. Thank you Trainwell for sponsoring today's video, for supporting our journalism. When you click that link, it helps support the channel and it gets you in on a discount, 14 days for free.